Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone today. My name is Bill Castanier. I'm president of the Historical Society of Greater Lansing. And we're going to showcase the Pave the Way exhibit today. Pave the Way is the story of the construction of the I-496 Expressway and how it dis dislocated more than 600 families and 200 businesses, primarily in the Main Street, St. Joe neighborhood. Um, we're going to start with the history of Lans Lansing, expressways in Lansing. And expressways can be traced back to the League of Wheelmen. And there's a photograph in the exhibit on that wall which shows um, a group of Lansing bikers. Not the kind of bikers you think of today, but they rode these big wheel bikes. And they were very popular in the turn of the last century. Um, one of the things they advocated for, though, was safe roads and roads that they could ride their bicycles on. They became the first uh, proponent for good roads in Michigan and a very famous gentleman named Horatio Good Roads Earl who was the first director of the Department of Transportation set out an effort to build good roads for Michigan and that that process went on right through World War One, when General Eisenhower discovered that troops in Germany could get around much easier because of the good road system they had there. He came back and started advocating also for good roads in the United States. And up until uh, 1939, that was moving as a, at, at a great momentum. Uh, in 1939, there was the World's Fair. Uh, the World's Fair had something called the Magic Motorways, where GM had an exhibit that showcased what the future of the landscape would look like with expressways. And there's an there's an example of that in this exhibit. And people came back for that. The millions and millions of people that went to that exhibit in New York came back with the idea that they should have good roads too. And that became the beginning of the uh, expressway system. Uh, it was interrupted, of course, by World War II. But after World War II, Eisenhower came back. And once again, he started the effort. He had seen the Autobahns and how they moved troops from place to place in Germany. He wanted to create a system like that in the United States if we ever came under attack. And we would be able to isolate our cities and evacuate them. Anyone that knows, though, the success of evacuating people out of cities <clears throat> because of hurricanes and things like that, it never did work well. In 1955, the uh, United States Department of Transportation issued a guide to what they thought would be the more than 100 expressways in the United States, and they detailed the location in what was called the Yellow Book. That Yellow Book basically became sort of the Bible across the United States for communities who thought expressways were a good idea. It only took a little less than 100 years to go from a big wheel bicycle to automobile congestion in this country. And one of the solutions that was brought forward by the federal government and lo local and state governments was to build expressways in the, in the nation's largest cities. Um, th that began in Lansing in 1955 when they first recognized that were expressways were being proposed. By 1958, an expressway in Lansing appeared in the uh, community annual plan. So that would be the first really recognition. In 1960. 61, the city said that yes, they would like to have an expressway built in Lansing. In 1964, uh, it was formally announced that the expressway construction would begin within a year. There were three sites considered for the expressway that we know of, and the information on that was garnered from the State Transportation Authority um, main engineer on the project. He said first they considered Saginaw, the throughway there. Uh, then they considered Mount Hope through the way. Those neither were suitable uh, for them. Uh, Saginaw was even much more dense than the Main Street St. Joe neighborhood and the um, Mount Hope uh, cross town would have taken out a partially a cemetery and a couple schools and several churches. So, but the big player in this is you can see right in the main window here it says Oldsmobile Expressway when it opened. Oldsmobile was the driver in this city during that period of time. What Oldsmobile wanted, basically Oldsmobile got. They wanted an expressway for a couple different reasons about located near them. One, it would help get their 
workers away from the job and to the job. There was amazing congestion because this was the height of the auto industry. The second thing is they wanted to be able to move their parts and semi-assembled vehicles along there with ease. So the location was chosen uh, in 1965. Um, there are some photographs here of the first um, house being torn down. It moved with great swiftness by uh, 66, 67. Um, the construction was well underway, and by 1968, the expressway, half of it opened from Waverly on the west side to Clare Street. That was by 68. By 1970, the expressway was totally completed, and that was, so that would have opened from Clare Street to about where Frandor is, US 127. So in a period of five years, the expressway was complete. It runs 11 miles. Uh, if you conclude the connector out on the east side, but the major, major part of the expressway through the city is 7.1 7 miles. So it takes a little less than seven minutes to go from border to border. Uh, one of the things that people thought would happen with expressways, it would drive more people downtown, it would be an incredible value to cities. Um, one of the things that happened was expressways go both ways. So there is a growth of the suburbs exponentially. So on the east side, we had Okemos, Hazlitt, Williamston, and on the west side, Delta Township grew substantially, and a lot of new housing and new construction for offices and retail grew out there. Well, one of the reasons you may be asking is we know that the highway went straight, straight through a neighborhood that was populated predominantly by people of color, African Americans. And you may ask why and how. Well, the one thing that we know about that is that as early as the 1930s, through the uh, New Deal legislation that made it possible for banks to segregate people by what we call redlining, understanding that you couldn't get a loan if certain uh, conditions weren't met. So what they did was color-coded all kinds of property by color. So if it was a high risk uh, for a loan default, or non-payment, then it was coded red, or conditions were uh, not favorable for whatever reasons. And so black people, people of color, were often targeted to be moved by real estate companies to certain areas based on redlining, which also meant that they could not move any place else along the city due to government uh, covenants and restricted codes that said we will only rent to white people, Caucasian people, or excluded black people, or covenants that said this is a suitable area for black people to leave. In the state journal, the local paper, on a, any Sunday afternoon you picked up the paper, you would see listing after listing after listing of real estate property that was segregated by color, by race. And so that is exactly why uh, that neighborhood on the West Side Corridor was populated by people of color. We see uh, actual uh, footage from the State Journal we have, some of those things in this exhibit We all, over there, and we also have deeds where it listed white only, and this happens to belong to somebody that's worked with this um, project, Bill Costanier. This is the actual deed that he had in his uh, loan showing that it was not for color, not for sale for color. Also, um, there's a collection by one of the real estate companies, um, Wen Stebbins, his family, donated a lot of the property listed that was restricted to black people. This grant and this project, Pave the Way, was explicit, explicitly designed to tell the rich story of what that neighborhood was like prior to the construction of the highway. And we have found story after story about what life was like. It didn't just start during this time period. The African American people had migrated here from the 60s, we'll talk about that, I mean from the early 30s, 40s, 50s through the Great Migration, which you'll hear a little bit more specifically about as we move forward. But as early as the early 1900s, there, were, there was presence of people, uh, African American people doing great things. Along the music line, there was Big Nick Nichols. He was a jazz musician that was born in Lansing, went to New York and worked with many of the jazz legends that we all heard of, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, 
uh, Charlie Bird Parker. So we know that Lansing's influence and the music of uh, the school districts and whatnot influenced his uh, career. Also, as early as 1913, there was a patent done by a man named Johnny Taylor for a six-star guitar, and we found that out, and we have a replica of that here. It's not the real thing, but that was showing the scientific, the ingenuity of the people in this area. Also, one of the bastions of this community was Johnny's Records. Johnny's Records was the spot. It was a community that sat right on the corner of uh, then Logan Street, now Martin Luther King Boulevard, and right at the entrance, almost at the entrance of Oldsmobile. And so you would see thousands of people going by on any given day, going from the 7 a.m. shift to the 3 p.m. shift to the 11 p.m. three shifts. And people would stop. Johnny was ahead of his time. Johnny sold records that were not available, music, clothing, articles that was not available to black people in any place else in the city. If he couldn't get it, if he didn't have it, he did what Amazon is doing. He'd mail order it and he would have you come back to the store and get it. Everybody talks about Johnny. The building itself still stands uh, is one of the only things there that we can really put our finger on that reminds us. However, it's something else and we have no visible evidence of what it looked like. We've been looking and looking and looking for pictures of it. But if you talk to anybody from that period or any of the descendants from those people, everybody talks about Johnny's Record Store. If you see this map, it shows the trailways up to and throughout the country. That became pretty important from the early 1920s up until the mid-70s. And it's been called in historical terms, the Great Migration. What it really means is that by thousands and thousands of African American people living under Jim Crow and in poverty situations, undereducated, were looking for a better way of life and trying to survive post the Reconstruction and the uh, Civil War, of course, and always the impact of slavery. However, they would come to the North First, sometimes the uh, families would come together. Oftentimes, the men would come. Also, because the uh, manufacturing industry was growing and booming at this time, there would be recruiters going to the South to recruit laborers to come up to the North. So it was a win-win situation. There were people looking for an employment. They were looking for employment and looking for a better way of living. Now just imagine, you've never been any place else but maybe in the rural part of the South or even in the what they call town. There weren't very big cities. You know, they, of course they had Char uh, Char Charlotte and all those people, but if you lived in the South and you were used to agricultural lifestyle and suddenly you decide to come up North for a better way, it could be a scary thing. Uh, we have a story of one family's migration. It's pretty intact. It's a remarkable story of the Turner family. Uh, Ken Turner is going to share that with you, but really try to imagine what that must have been like. And that's what the a lot of the people that came from the South that ended up on the corridor, that was their story. They were migrating here for a better uh, way of living, a better way of life, and that often meant congregating due to redlining, as we said, in the same neighborhood because it was segregated and they couldn't go, even in the North. They couldn't just live any place they wanted to live and be any place. So that created a very special connectivity close-knit reliance on each other, families watched out for each other. They all say what a safe, fun place it was to live. And we have a scene of the front porch because on any night, in the summer particularly, no air conditioning, no internet, no games, people congregated on the porch. They talked about the local gossip, they talked about what was going on in the neighborhood. Children played, they played they played and they played together. There would be baseball teams and kickball and all kinds of marbles and things like that. And everybody watched out for every other child's welfare and well-being. It truly was a village. And that's what the uh, expressway interrupted, a way of depending on each other and interacting with each other. Well, talking about the Great Migration, uh, my dad got a, received a call. They were living in Alabama at the time, down in a little town called Raglan, Alabama. 
and he got a call from a cousin that had moved up here in the late 40s, Manuel Davis, and told him that, hey, the plants up here are hiring. You guys should come up here and try to get a job. So my dad and another cousin, Cecil Wills, they came up here on the train. And ironically, they came up here on April 1st, 1951, which was one day after he had gotten married to my mom. And so the very next day after they getting married, they jumped on the train and came to Lansing to find a job. Well, it took him right about 10 days of walking around, and he did find a job at Atlas Drop Forge. And uh, at that point, he wrote a letter to my mom and told her that I got a job, I'm making $1.35 an hour, and uh, you think we can live on that? You know, and so he gave her specific instructions on how to come to Lansing from Raglan, Alabama, which is about 60 miles from Birmingham. So in the letter he wrote, he wrote to um, have my grandfather give her a ride to Birmingham to catch the train there and the train to take her to Nashville, Tennessee, jump on this other train. He named all the trains too. And to get off that train and get from Nashville, go to Chicago, and then you take the Grand Trunk from Chicago to Lansing. And when you get to Lansing, you go to 926 Max Avenue is where our cousins, the Davises, live. He said, wait there. When I get off work, I'll come get you. So she has specific instructions on how to get here. And uh, these things I didn't know until, I don't know, maybe at the most 10 years ago. And, uh, but, you know, just thinking back on it, you know, my mom was somebody who had never been as far from her house as probably East Lansing. You know, she didn't know anything about leaving the state of Alabama. And now here she was going to a totally new environment by herself on a train in the South in the early 50s. So I'm sure she had to be terrified of that, but you know, that's where her husband was and that's where our new life was gonna be. So she did come up and uh, like I said, they had a long life here together. You know, my dad stayed, the job he hired into, he retired from. So he stayed there 38 years at Atlas Drop Forge. And uh, my mom never worked a day in her life outside of the house. Her job, and that was the pact they made together, my dad told her, I'll make the money, pay the bills, you raise the kids. And it was six of us. You know, I told them they should have stopped after me, but for some reason they kept going. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, and it worked out because, you know, my dad was never outside of the house at any point in our life. You know, we had a full family, ate at the table together just about every day, definitely every Sunday. Went to Sunday school all the time, you know. Whether we wanted to or not, you go to Sunday school. And, uh, you know, we had, a, we had a real good life. And then back in the early 70s, well, early, late 60s, actually, you know, they came through and said that they were going to do some expansion on uh, Logan Street at the time and that we were going to have to move. And that was all part of the 496 project, you know, because they had to expand the lanes in, on uh, Logan Street to accommodate them. So, uh, you know, we ended up having to move, which was, you know, contentious for us because my dad told them, you know, my house was paid for. I worked all my life to have a house that's mine. And now you telling me I got to live in another area. I don't know my new neighbors. I'm comfortable where I'm at. My mortgage is paid off. Now I got to take in a new mortgage. So it wasn't a happy feeling for us because we were in a great neighborhood. I mean, we knew everybody up and down the streets. I mean, we were so comfortable back then. In the summertime, when we go on vacation back to Alabama, we would tell everybody, we're going to Alabama for two weeks. We're going to be gone. Blah, blah, you know, all the fun we was going to have. Nowadays, you can't do nothing like that, you know, because they'll be them broke in your house before you get out the driveway good. So, but that's just the neighborhood we lived in. And man, it was, and I got friends that I grew up with from kindergarten that I'm still friends with today and still talk to on a weekly or monthly basis. And uh, that's just how tight we are. You know, we walk to school because where we lived on Linaway, we walked to Kalamazoo Street School, we walked to West Junior High School, and we walked to Sexton. 
So we didn't know nothing about busing or go getting on the bus going nowhere. You get there by walking. And consequently, that's how our village of friends became tight because, you know, you walk together every day. And I had one friend that was so close with me, I wasn't going to school one day in elementary school. He told his mom, because he's not going, I don't want to go. And that's how close we were. And, uh, but you know, I got a great circle of friends, you know, like the neighborhood is a time that I'll never forget. You know, waking up on Saturday mornings, going down the street and drawing that circle, playing marbles. You know, we could do that all day. Just tear up all the knees and our jeans all the time. And but it didn't care. And I remember going to school with cardboard in my shoes, you know, because I had a hole in the bottom and, you know, trying to pull your socks down so that that uh, the heel part of your sock wasn't showing that it was blown out. <laughs> you know, just days like that, you know, kids have no concept of it now. They worried about Air Jordans and all that. We didn't care nothing about nothing like that. We just wanted something to cover our feet. It didn't matter. But, you know, the times is so much different now, and I really appreciate the times that I grew up in, in Lansing on the west side. You know, I'll never forget it. Well, as Kenny and Greta talked about earlier, about the great migration with the black people coming to Michigan and specifically to Lansing, that was, was so true as it was with my parents. In fact, uh, my dad worked at Atlas Drop Forge. It was with Kenny's dad, as a matter of fact. And we became friends uh, probably around 10 or 12 years old and shared the same paper route, as a matter of fact. But as far as the black church goes, it's always said that when you are lost in the woods, the first thing you do is find shelter and then food. In this case, when the black people came to Michigan, or Lansing specifically, they found a job and a church because the church offered so many things other than religion. Uh, the people in the church would tell you, the congregation would let you know where the black doctors were, what schools to go to, what restaurants were available, and how housing was in the area, along with many other things. So it's very, very important to find a church. Once you found that church, usually you found a job within the church. You could be a usher, you could be a nurse, you could be a deacon, you could be assistant pastor, Sunday school teacher. So it was very, very important to get involved because here again, that was your, 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 your church as well as your back, as we would call it. Now, in this particular case, as you see, they've got the pulpit, organ, uh, some of the choir robes because most churches had a nice choir to, again, have a nice spirit within the church. And blowing the church, my parents, when we went to church, we'd go to church starting on Saturday we go to choir rehearsal, and that lasted usually from noon till 2 o'clock. And then on Sunday, we went to the church at 11 and stayed there till about 2. And then went back again that evening for evening service. Then on Wednesday, we went to church from 7 to 9 for Wednesday night service. So we really, really, really kept busy during the church. And I'll tell you, whether we wanted to go or not, our parents almost made us go to church every Sunday, whether we wanted to or not as kids. And as we became older, and older, we pretty much enjoyed it. Uh, I played the drums in the church, as a matter of fact, and my mother was a singer, my sister was a singer, and my brother was a singer, and he played the organ. My two sisters were singers as well. So the whole family participated in the church services every Sunday, Wednesday, and on Saturdays as well. So here again, very, very important part of our lives was the church, and I think it wasn't just our family, but most of the black people within the community all went to church. Some were Baptists, some were Pentecostal, some were Church of God in Christ. It just depended on what your faith was and where it, it worked out for you and your family. But by and large, that was the thing to do, was go to church, and we all loved it. Now, that's my mother right there. Uh, she was a singer, as I said, and that uh, Jesse Richardson and the Earl Nelson singers, they both sang around the same period of time. Uh, the, Earl Nelson, El, the Earl Nelson singers were there before she was, but she came along about the same time. They did a little further afterwards. And then they had the, uh, it says here, the Pullen Sisters sang a lot, uh, Ed McMurray, and they also had, who else they got up there? They've got uh, Jesse Richardson, McMurray, Georgia Franklin. She was a very, very good gospel singer as well. So our community was one of which there's a lot of vibrant things going on there in the music part of the churches. And I wouldn't say there's a church on every corner, but a lot of different black churches in that community. And very, 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 very nice. Around 1960, uh, my parents and I lived on Olds Avenue, and Oldsmobile purchased our home to make a parking lot. 
and we moved about two blocks away to St. Joe and at that time Logan Street. And our house was right next to an alley and next to the alley was a liquor store, a church, and a dentist office. My dad became real good friends with the owner of the liquor store and I became real good friends with his son. It was Frank Spagnola's liquor store called Spags and his son's name was Frank Jr. So Frank Jr. and I were about the same age. I might have been a year or two older. We became very good friends. And as I said, my dad and Frank became good friends. So consequently, Spags started a Pop Warren football team called the Spags Falcons. And we were very, very, very good. In fact, we were probably winning most of our games like 56 to nothing, 56 to seven. And nobody wanted to play us because we were so good. The teams, not just our team, but the Pop Warner teams in that era were so popular, we'd have 250 to 500 people coming to St. Joe Park just to watch the games on a Sunday or Saturday afternoon. I mean, more than, than Sexton would have almost. So it was really, really nice. After you went from Spag's team, you went to West Junior and played football, what we called Gladiator School, and then you went from there to Sexton to play football. And consequently, most of the people that you played with at Spag's, you played with again at West Junior, then again at Sexton. So they were real, real good friends. We're all good friends. And that same quarterback and that same wide receiver from Pop Warner League to, to, to West Junior to Sexton were so good because they had played together for three or four years, as well as in the backyard. So all those things became prevalent, and most of those kids went on to, some of them even went to bigger colleges like Michigan State or Eastern Michigan or Western Michigan University. But back to Spags, as I said, we were really, really, really good. And unfortunately, being such prejudiced times, people were getting death threats himself because our team was, uh, I'm gonna say it was all black come to think of it. I don't think we had any white players on our team. And he got calls saying, why are you buying those inward people, those nice uniforms? We're gonna burn your store down and thank God that never happened. But that's just where those times were in those times, which is unfortunate as it is. But we all enjoyed Frank and uh, he was here just a couple weeks ago and he was uh, in tears himself because he hadn't seen me in many, many years. And some of the other guys, Kenny, he hadn't seen in a long time. And it was just really warmed our hearts to, to be together. So those, those kinds of things, again, along with the black church are just so warm back in those days. And that's what we talked about uh, when the expressway came through it being a, a way of life taken away because it just didn't seem the same anymore nowadays. Yeah, kids still play pop one football. Yeah, Sexton still plays football. But there's just not the continuity and the, the togetherness of the families, uh, close-knit families that were there in the, in the 60s. And as Kenny said before, when people in Greta said people could watch your home uh, while you went to work or whether you went to school, uh, one family could spank the other kid's family. When you got home, you got another spanking. Because that's just the way it was. I mean, everybody looked, about, looked after everybody. And, you know, that's just the way it was. Very, very, very nice. My brother, Michael Burton, uh, was a designer for GM, for Ford, and for Chrysler. After he left high school, he had a friend named Bob Riddle, who was an older gentleman, kind of a, what do you want to call it? Uh, somebody who looked after he and I both. He got me in college, he got my brother in college. When I say got us in college, he made recommendations for us because he was the president of the Urban League, so he had a, quite a bit of weight. My brother was interested in art, so all of the time around the house, he would just draw and draw and draw. When his age would be about maybe eight, nine, or 10 or 11, and we'd be outside playing and, and, and laughing, all the guys playing basketball and football in the backyard, and, like spags and stuff, he didn't want to play. All he wanted to do was draw, draw, draw. So we made fun of him. You know, your brother, you gotta make fun of him. And I made up a story once. I said, hey, Mike, Susie, she likes you, man. She really wants to touch you. She's outside, man. Come on, come on, let's go see her. He's drawing, drawing, drawing. I said, come on, man. And the drope was on me, because he never got up. He never came out. So that's just how much he was focused on what he was doing. So he goes to Oral Roberts College to get his degree as a minister. And while he's down there, a friend of his from Detroit calls and said, hey, Mike, uh, uh, some of the stuff that you and Bob Riddle were working on for, for General Motors, uh, kind of went through. You need to come back up here right away. He says, are you serious, sir? So he goes back up and they ask him to send them some of his artwork, some of his raw drawings, and he did. And they were overwhelmed of the eye that he has for art, for having no skills at it at all, just doing it you know, as, a, as a layman. So consequently, he got into the arts program there at General Motors and became a technician and started drawing cars for them. But before that, he was with, like I said, Lee Alacoca, and Ford came and stole him from Chrysler, and then GM came and stole him from Ford. So he ended up with General Motors. 
he designed the Buick Enclave, the interior of the Buick Enclave, and he learned how to do all this stuff as, at home by himself, and he learned to spell when he was just a youngster by all the cars that would go up and down the street. Because as I said, we lived on St. Joe, which is the main route for all the cars to go back and forth as they shipped out all over the world. So he'd see a Cutlass go by, C-U-T-L-S, Oldsmobile, O-L-D-S. And he's, he's a kid. That's how he learned to spell, and he really, really did. It's a true story. So as it stands right now, he is the only designer, not just black, but the only designer, period, in the history of the auto industry that's worked for all three of the big three as a designer. No one's ever done that before in life. Now, there have been others that worked in other capacities, but never as a designer of cars. So I really commend my brother for that. And as you can see, uh, that's some of his work there. As a child, that's some of the stuff he did at home, right there just sketching, in his early years at General Motors. Now, they're rough sketches, but some of the stuff that he's drawn then are on the road today. Not the exact cars, but some of the styles, the wings, the, the lights, the, the way the doors are. Some of the cars are lower now. All those things he thought of years ago, and they all came to pass. So I'm very, very proud of my brother. Unfortunately, he died about five years ago of melanoma cancer. And you just never know in life, but uh, that's what he had. And unfortunately, how he found out was he worked out every day at the YMCA. He would run miles and miles every day. And he had a nosebleed, and his nose would not stop bleeding. So he ended up bleeding out all the blood in his body through his nose. They'd put a pint in, a pint would come out. Put a pint in, a pint would come out. So that's how he found out that he had cancer, because his blood wouldn't clot. So he found out that, and he lived about seven more years after surgery, after surgery, after surgery, and then finally he succumbed. But God put him on earth for a reason. And what's so ironic about this is his name is Michael Angelo Burton. That was his real name. Never know in life. Thank you. What we're looking at here particularly is the history of the re retail sector in the St. Joe Main Street community that was destroyed by the construction of the expressway. There's se several notable businesses that people remember, especially like Let's Clothing, which got moved three different times uh, because of eminent domain. Um, and there's a photograph of here, an early photograph of Bill Letts. Uh, with a um, someone from uh, the cotillion and this is one of the wedding dresses that he would have sold in his store this is the actual dress from his store this is the heart one of the hardest things to put together because I think it was mentioned earlier uh, there's no photographs of Johnny's records the retail sector wasn't well photographed and some of the photographs we have are not great but they're what we could find uh, there's Fred and Bill's diner there's William Anderson's soda shop all the kids would remember and tell you tales about you know, going there. And these were almost all segregated businesses. The African American community would be required to have their own doctors, dentists, lawyers, and they're all within blocks of each other. Uh, African Americans could not take their clothing to white dry cleaners, so they had to have their own, own dry cleaners. All these businesses were pretty much destroyed uh, because of I-496 Expressway and did not reopen because they could not get loans. Um, so there was a great loss of entrepreneurship. There, were, there was literally scores of beauticians and barbershops in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were like typical, would be in somebody's basement or home. Uh, and we have some ads from some of those here. The one really, one of the really unique things we found, it's not technically a business, but um, that little tiny rocking chair right there is 60 some years old and it was made by the shuffle family who went on to create the whole toy giveaway at Christmas making wooden toys. That's an original rocker right there that he gave somebody in the community. He was originally located on Main Street. His house was torn down. So that, that rocker has seen a lot of life and it meant so much to the young girl. She kept it all this, all this time. Uh, photos by Fred is really important. Um, Fred um, was the informal, formal photographer for the African American community. So when they had social events, he was the, by default the photographer. Um, we've discovered probably 20,000 of his photographs that are going to end up in the Capital Area District Library that will be archived. Very important history of the 1950s and 60s in Lansing. And then it shows you what segregation looked like during that period of time. Uh, you know, when I originally looked at some of them, I thought, boy, these look like people's basements. You know, they're having social events. Well, it's pretty obvious the answer. They couldn't go anywhere else. 
So there would have been like the Tropicana Bar, that was the black bar in Lansing. That was the Jazz and Blues Bar, which would attract all kinds of black jazz and blues players on their way to like Idlewood or Idlewild or Chicago or Detroit. They'd do a stop over here before moving on. So that was well known across the United States. Um, I think it's just a, just a gives you a good look at um, what the neighborhood looked like. There's Bob's Shoe Repair. Uh, everybody picks their shoes back then. They just didn't go out and buy new. And uh, Bob's um, son, Warren Williams, went on to become one of the first black newscasters. Well, the, definitely the first black newscaster in Lansing. And then he went on to some major networks. So there's, there's quite a history. Um, a lot of the kids had jobs in these stores. And once they moved um, or destroyed, they had no, no longer had those jobs. So there was a loss of an economic uh, loss too. And it's something that needed to be recorded and we, we're gonna continue to look for photographs from the businesses and stories. Uh, we recorded 100 oral histories that'll be available on YouTube very soon. And they tell the story of the neighborhood in a very intimate way. And I think those will be listened to 100 years from now. Well, my name is CISO, S-I-S-O. Uh, I own my own business that deals with creativity as well as exhibitions. So, as a practitioner, I thoroughly enjoy the fact that this exhibit exists inside the NAP Center, but notably, my favorite thing that I've seen so far about this exhibit is witnessing people of color in downtown Lansing. Now we know they exist, we know that they're everywhere, but I truly believe, you know, being a person of color myself, there's some important sentiment about being able to see yourself. So I would say my favorite thing so far about this exhibit is representation. I see people of older generations literally going back, combing through the memories they have in their mind, but I also know, you know, how they feel to see themselves not only represented, but appropriately and genuinely represented. And I just wanted to make a note that that is something that happens every single day when these people walk by this exhibit. So that's one of the reasons I'm so thrilled uh, that it's downtown, that it's here in downtown Lansing.